Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'm going to be taking it from 12 to 3. And if it's Monday, you know we are going to have great trials here at the Law and Crime Network. And I have with me one of my besties, the Gene Rossi Show. He's got his own radio show. I had the pleasure of speaking with him also this weekend. Hashtag 4041. Gene's uh, been a stalwart at the Department of Justice where he served three decades, where they actually have a Gene Rossi war room. Gene, great to be back on with you. Oh, it's good to be back. Good to be back. So, Gene, uh, let, let's talk about this, uh, this really sad case. We just listened to uh, the medical examiner talking about how young Sterling, four months old, was dehydrated, uh, emaciated tissue that flies feed off of. It's really horrific testimony um, in the area of where that diaper was. Very powerful testimony. Let me tell you this. If I'm a juror and I do not have water in my eyes, uh, I don't have a heart and I don't have a mind. I, I can't imagine how the jury is, is accepting or how receptive they are to this graphic testimony. As a defense attorney, you just you just sit there and you you try to try to do the best you can. It's just incredibly powerful testimony for the government. Yeah. So, Gene, tell us. I mean, it is very powerful. It'll have a visceral reaction with the jury for sure. But there's also a legal reason as to why they're presenting this testimony vis-a-vis -vis yes. the charges that they're charged with. So, enlighten our viewers a little bit about why the prosecutor is being so specific about these injuries. Well, I'm going to mention a Jason Van Dyke trial. If, if he had taken the life of McDonald, uh, Laquan McDonald, with one bullet, uh, Jason Vic Van Dyke in Chicago, the police officer, he may have um, had a different result. The way someone passes away, the manner of death, the number of knives in the body, the number of bullets in the body, that is relevant towards premeditation, reckless disregard, wanton disregard for human life, days and weeks. That's why you put in all that stuff from the medical examiner. It's crucial. Yeah, and, and as I was saying to the viewers before, it is the most crucial part of the state's case because, as you've just alluded to, Gene, it's not a singular thing of neglect. It's, it's a constellation of neglect all leading up to the death, which shows it brings the conduct more towards the purposeful or knowing uh, and certainly a high degree of recklessness. And when we judge conduct as jurors uh, and as prosecutors, when we present those cases, we want to throw as many bullets, if you will, to show so many different data points as to where they were neglectful so you can get over that hurdle beyond a reasonable doubt. You agree? Yes. And I want to add this. Premeditated murder is not a stretch in this case, first degree, mm -hmm. because Based on what the medical examiner said, you get the impression as a parent or someone who knows how to raise a child or, you know, had parents who raised you, when a parent neglects you to the degree that, that Zachary and Cheyenne neglected poor Sterling who passed away, that shows that they almost wanted him to pass away, but they didn't have the guts to take his life. That's the argument I would make in opening and closing uh, as a prosecutor. They didn't have the guts, so they let him suffer and tortured him to death. I think that's a fair read, Gene, especially when you add to that that the other child was taken care of, as was the dog. Um, I think that that's something I would be rattling off over and over again as a prosecutor in summation. Gene, we also had um, another witness here. It was really interesting. Uh, this is why I love experts. Uh, Timothy Huntington is a forensic entomologist and offered some very compelling testimony as well. Let's take a look. All right, so it's your opinion and you hold that to a reasonable degree of uh, scientific certainty that Sterling was alive when he was infested? Yes, absolutely. Do you have an opinion as to how long Sterling had been infested while he was still living? Yes. Um, the period of infestation for those maggots to develop to the stage that they were at would have been between 9 and 13 days. Would that make... August 20th being the latest date uh, at the minimum when the infestation could start? Uh, that, would, that would put it at, yeah, the, the 20th or 21st would be the, the, the last possible date, and it certainly could have been before that. Do 
you have an opinion as to whether during this period of infestation that Sterling had been cleaned, bathed, or been moved at all? Yes. And what the, is that opinion? The maggots in association with Sterling's diaper um, were there primarily to feed on, well, they were attracted to one of really three things. Uh, either the feces, the urine, um, or, or the, the, the extreme diaper rash. Um, if there had been bathing or diaper changing or changing of the clothing or bedding, things of that nature, um, those maggots would have gone with the, the, the changing. So um, if, you, if you think about you know, maggots in a, in a diaper full of feces, you change a baby's diaper, you wipe off the feces, that takes that food source with it, and those maggots are going to be associated with the food source. Um, so had any of that taken place, those maggots would have gone away. Um, they wouldn't have been developed to the stage that they were found. Um, and in this case, um, again, the feces, urine soaking, um, and then that, that um, kind of a, a extreme diaper rash could have been attractive. Any of the three could have been an attraction to those flies and they're gonna to try to gain access. For the flies to lay eggs, they, they have to be able to get to it uh, because they're not just gonna dump out eggs somewhere and hope that their maggots crawl to it. Um, so there's gonna be um, a period of time where the flies are, are crawling into the area trying to get access to that diaper area. How long would, would Sterling have needed to be in that dirty diaper before that, that attraction started? Well, the, the attraction can certainly start right away um, because anybody who's ever been around little kids you know when a kid has a dirty diaper if you can smell it the flies can smell it way before you can and so that would be enough of an attraction for the flies to say hey there's a spot i can lay eggs um, but for for the flies to actually get to that area would have taken some more time um, diapers of course, are designed to keep all of that stuff in, right? That's that's why we buy diapers, um, and so that's going to going to provide a pretty extreme barrier for the flies to gain access, and it's going to take them some time to defeat those barriers. And, and how do they do that? Well, they can certainly smell it, and then once they once they can smell that attraction, they they look for just about any way they can to. So there's one of the state's experts, uh, Timothy Huntington. Uh, Gene, I mean, what we're listening to is just really graphic again, very visceral to a jury, that um, 9 to 13 days is this infestation period with the maggots. And, you know, you always get an education when you listen to these experts. Basically, these maggots are feeding off feces, urine, and rash. Um, that's the food source for them. And very compelling, we see a picture of her, you know, obviously uh, disturbed in her face. Uh, but he's saying, Gene, that if it had any bathing been done, the food source for these maggots would have gone away and he would not have been in this state. So uh, this was a significant period of time, goes to your point of showing like almost purposeful conduct, no? It just, this, this is really proving premeditation. He is a phenomenal witness. The key part of his testimony to me is, at the latest, Bob, at the latest, the, the maggots, I can't believe I'm saying this, the maggots started, um, you know, infestating uh, Sterling August 21 at the latest. The 911 call, I think, was uh, done on August 30th. So what does that mean? At least for nine days, there were flies and maggots around Sterling, and these two parents basically walked by that child, fed the dog in the morning, night, cared for the dog and the daughter, and did not care one bit about Sterling. That's devastating. Yeah, and, and one can only imagine, Gene, that while all that's going on, I also thought it was impactful when he talks about the smell of the diaper. And, and what we would know for a certainty would be the crying of the baby as it's starving and, and walking by, as you put it. And this would be a big theme for me as a prosecutor, feeding the daughter, feeding the dog, and just leaving that child screaming in pain as it's dehydrating and is not nourished.
properly. I think it's really bad stuff. Gene, real quick, we have a lot of lawyers that watch this show and, and young budding lawyers and a, and a cadre of true crime followers here at the Law and Crime Network. Talk to us a little bit about this legal thing that goes on where they ask within a reasonable degree of certainty what the prosecutor is doing and why they have to use those magic words. <laughs> All right. When you call an expert in, say, as a medical examiner or fingerprint expert, um, uh, a ballistics expert, you obviously have to establish a foundation that they have the qualifications. The second thing you have to do is whatever they study and whatever they conclude, it's been peer reviewed by authorities, fellow experts. And then the punchline is this magic word, depending on your expert, do you have an opinion as to a reasonable degree of medical certainty based on your qualifications and your peer review process? Do you have a reasonable degree of medical certainty of an opinion that such and such may have happened? And then they give the punchline, whether it's a print, a ballistic, the entomologist, the manner of death. That's how you do it. Right. And because, of course, <clears throat> the experts are the only ones allowed in court to give opinions as opposed to actual facts. So they have that degree of scientific reliability, as Gene Rossi has aptly put. And that is why the prosecutor puts those kinds of questions to the expert. <laughs> Guys, it is gavel to gavel coverage here at the Law and Crime Network. We're going to go to a quick break. Stick with us. I'm going to go into the chat room on lawandcrime.com. In the meantime, we'll be right back. Uh, I gotta tell you, Gene, you know, I'm a seasoned homicide prosecutor, but there's just something about this case that is really disturbing to me. I'm, you, you're listening to this woman talk about how she holds their babies because she wants them to know that they're there, of the love and caring of a vulnerable baby and the love that it needs and the love that it gives back and that Sterling was a happy boy. Um, and, and there's this mother. There's a picture of her right there, Gene. I just think it's disgusting. So I guess my question to you, my friend, is how do you defend this case? Well, I'm always putting on my defense attorney hat, and I'm going to put on my defense attorney hat now. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to make this uh, argument that that witness was not as bad as it could be for the defense. Here's why. Up until the end of July, early August, it appears that Cheyenne was organized was thoughtful, was caring, was um, considerate of Sterling and, of course, the, the daughter, was helping the babysitter uh, take care of both ch children up until the end of July, early August. Then I go to my defense. My defense would be this. Something dramatic and inconsistent with her treatment earlier of her son. Something dramatic happened. And I just saw on the screen that they're filing an intoxication defense. Whether it was drugs, whether it was intoxication, that's, that's an argument that can mitigate premeditation. She just fell off the tracks. Pre, I thought this was going on for maybe eight months. But this, uh, you know, tragically, it only took a couple of weeks. So as a defense attorney, I'm going to say mitigation is here. Fair that's enough. the best you can do. That's the best you can do. Fair enough, Gene. And, and that's, listen, that's what we do as lawyers. I mean, we, as a good prosecutor, you think about what will the defense say in order to be able to try to combat that. And so we, you know, the, people think we're odd for doing this, but we play both sides of the equation out. Makes us better lawyers. Thank you, Gene, for that answer. Very adept, of course, as always. We're going to go to break. Please stick with us. Hey, guys in that chat room, you're bringing out some great commentary. I'm going to go back in there, and we'll be back with more law, crime, and this fascinating and sad tragic case on the other end of the break. Right here. Wow. Uh, I, you know, Gene, I, I just can't say it enough. Uh, you know, listening to this testimony, his eyes, little Sterling fixed and dilated, just staring, blood around his mouth, his arm was stiff, rigid, his fists were clenched. His extremities were all cold, uh, not breathing, and then she um, 
contacts law enforcement because something's not right. Gene, this is a retired registered nurse who is a first responder. This is a seasoned medical professional, and you can see how moved she was by what she witnessed. It's almost like a medical examiner getting emotional uh, doing an autopsy. I mean, she's seen it all. Uh, Bob, I go back, I, I don't know if we're gonna play it today, but I go back to that video of um, the husband when he's being interviewed in the daughter's room, and the room is just pristine, it's neat, she's clean, and in the next room is, is poor Sterling in just a decrepit state. It, it, it really is a bad fact pattern for the defense. Yeah, there's there's a picture right up on the screen, Gene. Only our producers can do stuff like this. And, and that's, that's what you're alluding to. I'm not sure if you yes. can see it. Um, and yep. there's the other child. And as you indicated, this is a very powerful piece of evidence for the prosecution that if your defense, let's get to this a little bit, yes. uh, this quote-unquote yep. intoxication is at play, then explain to me, how that child is well nourished, well taken care of, in, in a state of healthy, you know, places where she should be, and the dog is taken care of and fed, and you are taken care of and fed, and yet, does this intoxication defense only apply to the four month old baby? That's the strangest intoxication defense I've ever heard. That's that's the, the Achilles heel of that defense argument that I just talked about. But, but for your listeners, I, I, we got to give the listeners, you know, the prosecution uh, argument and the defense argument because uh, that's how trials work. And you're trying to get one juror, if not more, to say reasonable doubt. But you're right. That is the Achilles heel of the uh, intoxication defense. Okay, she took care of the dog, made sure he's got the Yukonuba, took care of the daughter who had a beautiful, pristine room and looked healthy. And then you got poor Sterling, who's with maggots and urine and is basically ignored. Um, that just doesn't work. The only thing that, go to, that comes out of this case, Gene, is what long crime has done all along with this case, is to talk about uh, the problems that we have with babies and taking care of them and all the services that are out there. And that if you see something, say something. Uh, if you see some other family, that it's our collective responsibility to make sure these little precious gifts from God are properly taken care of. And this case is just such a sad case to me. Anyway. Okay, welcome back to Law Crime Network, Gavel to Gavel coverage. As you know, we are doing the Cheyenne Harris case. It is a absolutely brutal and horrible case. We've been listening to some overwhelming, compelling evidence being brought on by the prosecution. I've had my guest, Gene Rossi, my hashtag 4041 with me, but I've got yet another great guest with me. Roger P. Foley is a criminal defense attorney out of Florida. The man is seriously accomplished. Actually, I'm looking at your bio here. Uh, you graduated at the University University of Alabama with extensive studying of criminology, chemistry, and Spanish. Uh, you're a member of all sorts of bar associations. Roger, first time you're on with me, but uh, welcome, and I'm glad to have you on the show with us. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be with you. Yeah, so listen, uh, Roger, Gene, we, we were listening to Ms. Shriver before. Um, we've had some great medical testimony. When we say great as prosecutors, what we mean by that is it's, it's advancing the ball forward for conviction. There's certainly nothing great about this case. But there's nothing better as a prosecutor than to get a regular old school witness that can give you some compelling information. And the prosecution is getting that from this Ms. Shriver, who basically has already testified was taking care of the baby and that little Sterling was underweight, but he was a happy and a cute boy and how she used to hold him all the time and coochie coochie said and make him smile. Um, it's very powerful information to a jury. Let's listen to some more of that and I'll come back with these awesome guests on the other end. So when they were, did you see Cheyenne Harris arrive home? I did. And tell me what you mean, how you saw her. I seen her walking up the sidewalk. I, I could hear their car pull up. They didn't have the quietest car. So I heard them pull up and see her walking up into their apartment. And what time of day was that? I'm not 100% sure. Did you watch Sterling overnight? Yes. Would it have been the next day? Yes. Um, after Miss Cheyenne arrived home and you saw her walking into the apartment complex, did she come directly to pick up the children? No. What happened? 
Uh, she had texted and said that she needed a minute if she could have a few minutes to just get herself together before coming to get the kids. Did you agree? I did. What happened next? Um, Nala ran out of milk and she was on her last diaper and I drew her a text telling her that it was time that she needed to come get the kids. And did she come get the kids? Uh, no. Well, how long was it after she arrived at the apartment complex and she said she needed a little time? Did you reach out to her and say that she needed to come get the kids? I don't know how much time it passed. I just knew that her baby needed milk and needed diapers. And they were starting to get fuzzy. And you told her that she needed to come right away? No. Well, what happened? Um, me and my boyfriend, I ended up grabbing the kids' stuff and we brought them over to her. Why did you do that? Because Nella was, was fussy. She needed a diaper change. She needed milk. Things like that. What happened when you went to the defendant's apartment? Um, Ms. Harris came to the door and seen that I had brought the kids over to her and she kind of <sighs> and rolled her eyes like she wasn't ready to have the kids back up. And did you give her the kids? Yes. Was that the last time that you saw Sterling alive? Yes. Roger P. Foley, this testimony from this witness is devastating to the defense's case because it's also bringing out other instances in which the mother, the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, is negligent, is not doing what she's supposed to be doing. Her kids don't have milk and diapers, and she is being responsible, brings them to the house, and then mom rolls her eyes at her for bringing the kids home. Roger, you're a really seriously accomplished defense lawyer. What do you do with a client facing these facts? You do the best you can. I mean, she's in a very difficult situation. This child was was left in his own feces, no diapers, malnutrition. I mean, it's the facts are horrible. Um, the defense is, is going to do the best that they can, but there's not a lot to play with here, Bob. Yeah, and they're, they're coming up with the intoxication defense. Real quick, in 10 seconds or less, do you agree with me and Gene Rossi that this is going to be difficult when the other child was well taken care of, was being fed, the dog was being fed, the rest of the family's being fed, only he, uh, Sterling, was in the state of disrepair? That makes the intoxication defense very hard in my mind. I, I do think it makes it very difficult, but they're probably going to do as much as they can to show her addiction, show the day-to-day -day problems, and possibly even show that she was slightly negligent with the other kids, that, that maybe that child, that baby, the newborn baby, has a higher difficulty of need. Right. Well, Roger, uh, I think they're going to have a rough road. I'm going to go into that intoxication defense a little bit more on the other end of the break, so stick with us, and we'll go over the law of that. How did you learn that Sterling had died? Um, I was freshly out of the hospital, just gotten home. Um, I went outside for a cigarette, and I noticed that Mr. Cohen was outside. And I said hi, but he didn't say anything back to me. So I walked over to him, and I said, is everything okay? And that's when he stated to me that he is gone. And I said, who's gone? He said, my boy. I said, what do you mean gone? He's just gone, he said. And what did you say next? I said, I don't remember exactly what I said next, but I said he maybe he's dead, he's gone. I don't know. What was exactly. Mr. Cohen doing? He was outside smoking a cigarette. Did that upset you? Um, if, a little bit. Um, yeah, I told him. I said if if your baby's gone, um, I said have you called anybody? Have you called nine one one or anything? He's, he's like we don't know what to do. I was like well you need to put your cigarette down and you should probably go inside and call nine one one. Did you see Miss Harris? I didn't see Miss Harris for um, some time I passed there. Wow. I mean, unbelievable. My baby's gone, and, and he's out there smoking a cigarette. She's asking, did you call 911? I mean, that would be the appropriate thing to do rather than taking a drag of your cigarette. And, and he's not responding. It's just amazing. Um, guys, let's go to the intoxication defense, because it can be the only thing that the defense can argue in this case. And I have Roger P. Foley with me. I think, Roger, you've looked up the law specifically. Tell us what the defense is here. What do they have to prove? Because in some states, if you voluntarily ingest an intoxicating substance like in New Jersey, you cannot avail yourself of that defense. But that's not true here. Is that right? Correct. In, in, in Iowa, Bob, uh, you can use the, the voluntary intoxication defense. But what you have to show 
is that you're not of the right mind, meaning that whatever that toxic substance you are, if it's drugs in this case, if it's methamphetamines, that you are really out of it, that your mind is not functioning properly. And the way the law is written in Iowa, if you have even a little thought like, hey, I wonder how my baby's doing, then the defense doesn't work. Because, it, you know, it, it, is a, it is a defense, but it's not a defense that will give her not guilty. It is a defense that is used simply to reduce the charge to a lower level, not to exclude her culpability. And, and what would that mean here? Like, what lower level? Premeditated down to, like, a manslaughter? Correct. To a second-degree murder case or to a pot in a really good case, which I don't think this is, than possibly to manslaughter, but really a second-degree murder charge. Okay, so Gene Rossi, what we're hearing is that it's a very difficult charge to prove, and so like everything else, it comes down to facts, and we just listened to expert testimony where this poor child was from 9 to 13 days in a maggot-infested state. And to Roger's point, with all of the things that were not done, how do you argue that you can avail yourself to the intoxication defense, which I would say probably is more likely to be used in a flash-like scenario where maybe somebody murders somebody uh, and they're under the influence? This is a long, drawn-out process of death, no? Well, I can give you an example of a murder trial in uh, Albemarle County, Virginia. It was at UVA, and uh, George Ugely V uh, got in a drunken rage. He drank about a case of beer. He went to his ex-girlfriend's apartment on campus, and he threw her against the wall and crushed her skull. He was charged with capital murder, first degree, premeditated. The jury came back and found him guilty of involuntary manslaughter because that it was a, a, an intoxication defense. What it did, it erased and mitigated the first degree, and the jury was able to find that the defendant acted with wanton and reckless disregard for human life when he got intoxicated. That brought it down to involuntary manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter is when, you know, I catch my wife in a compromising position with my best friend, and I lose it and I kill him. That's voluntary. Involuntary would be intoxication. So, guys, let me ask you real quick. Uh, do you, as a defense lawyer, argue in the alternative with this case? That is, she's not guilty uh, of, of this crime, period. But if she is, uh, we want you to consider the intoxication defense. You guys know that those sometimes are hard arguments to make. What would you be doing, Roger? I, okay. I I, I don't like mixing up the jury. I, I want to go in this in this fact pattern. You're trying to reduce it. You're using that involuntary intoxication to hope that you can get a second degree murder charge or possibly a manslaughter uh, charge. But but giving two different theories is, is usually a mistake, in my opinion, although it is allowed in Iowa. Yeah. And, and Gene, I've, I've uh, prosecuted cases where the defense has actually made that argument. Uh, both sides of the argument because the client forced the lawyers to do that against their judgment. What do you think happens here? Uh, if I were if I were representing her, given all these witnesses, the facts are just horrible. I would say members of the jury, the key issue for you is what was in Cheyenne Harris's mind. And you have to determine, did she have premeditation? Did she absolutely want her son Sterling dead? period. Or was she so overcome by intoxication, drug use, postpartum depression, that her mind was not operating in a way that we would expect someone as a mother to operate? And therefore, you must find beyond that they did not meet their burden on premeditation. That's what I would argue. Well, let me tell my audience the following. I can tell you beyond a reasonable doubt <laughs> that this is why the Law and Crime Network is one of a kind, because only on this kind of show can you get the expertise that we just listened to from Gene and Roger. I thank you so much for that. We got to go to break. Stick with us. We still got a lot more fascinating stuff ahead. When you said you went to the apartment and you used drugs, you said that there were some drugs already in the apartment that you used, and maybe one time you brought drugs, correct? Correct. Do you know how Mr. Cohen and Ms. Harris got the methamphetamines that they used? No. Do you know how they paid for the drugs that they were using? No, I do not. 
Did you get methamphetamine from Mr. Cohen? At times, yes. Did he pay you? Um, at times, yes. Okay, so, guys, this is one of the reasons I asked the producers to run all these clips together. We have the police officer where Cheyenne is saying she did methamphetamine. We have a DHS worker where she's saying she did methamphetamine. The DHS worker, the prosecutor, got out. Uh, that is of concern to them because when you're using illicit drugs like that, you tend not to take care of the needs of your child. And then we had this character, Jordan Clark, who uh, is giving testimony that they're doing methamphetamine in the house while the little other girl is playing in the living room. Uh, I think that this is all great for the prosecution. And while it brings up drugs and while there is an intoxication defense, I think they're showing that they weren't under the influence all the time. But these are just really bad people who chose drugs over the care of the little four month old boy. Roger, thoughts? You know, I, I think that, that that's definitely a possibility. Um, but it's also helping the defense to some extent. Um, but as you listen to Jordan Clark, I, I mean, the, the guy's a clown. I mean, he's basically admitting that he's using crystal meth in front of children, that he's supplying it to the father. Um, it just makes you not like, like, like the people in this case at all, right? I mean, I can't imagine any juror sitting there going, oh, yeah, let me pay attention to him. And then when you look at DCF, you know, they knew that she had meth in her system when the child was born. It was it was in her umbilical cord. But they, they're getting involved now and they're talking now. But there's some there's some some anger that should be targeted towards child protective services. Because what did they do? They knew we had a mother that was born that, that a child was born while the mother was taking meth. And they didn't do anything. But now they're talking today. So, you know, some of that anger has got to be directed at, at children and families as well. Well, Gene, I, they're very good points. And, and to Roger's point, though, uh, as it relates to the intoxication defense, um, I think the prosecutor is very shrewd in getting this out because in addition to the fact that he's showing the negligence and the lack of care or concern for these kids doing meth literally while they're feet away, um, but it's also bloodying the character of these defendants up, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And here's the other reason why they're bringing it out. The prosecution knows that the defense is going to bring it out anyway. So embrace your negatives. If this is a negative, bring it out during your case so that when the defense puts on their drug defense or intoxication defense, it doesn't have as much of a sting. But the most important thing that I got out of Jordan Clark is this. Those parents were able to get high and at the same time take care of a child responsibly. It sounds counterintuitive, but they were able to take care of the daughter copacetically while they got high. But when Jordan was at that apartment, he never heard of a baby. He never saw that door open. That goes to premeditation. And what the government's saying is, yeah, they got high. They did meth. They probably did coke and weed. God knows what, mm -hmm. but they were able to maintain that premeditation to kill Sterling. Right, and as some of the chatters on, on our blog are indicating, she simply didn't want the child, because uh, they're not going to be able to answer that question, Gene. We've talked about this before, and Roger, that they were able to take care of the other child and the dog and themselves, but not Sterling. I would add one other point. While she's telling the DHS worker that she's using methamphetamine, at least the DHS worker must have thought at the time she still was capable of caring for the child. So in other words, she wasn't just under uh, a flashpoint at a given moment like Gene the example you gave before where somebody goes and just kills somebody when they're in an intoxicated state, but rather that's periods of time they are not in an intoxicated yeah. state. And during that period of time for nine to 12 days, Sterling lays in his feces and his urine as maggots are developing on his body. I don't think the defense is going to work in this case. I think it's going to go down in a flash of flames, but we have to take a break and we'll be right back. Okay, so what this is, the police interview with Cheyenne Harris. We have another quick clip that we're going to show you, and I'll be back with our guests on the other end. I have an interesting question um, or statement that was made in the chat room that I want to go over with our guests I think is really important for the prosecution. We'll be right back. She wakes me up running.
is everybody sleeping? In, in um, she was actually in the playpen right next to the bed. Okay. When you found Sterling, did, um, did you take him out of the swing or is he, is he still in the swing? He was still in the swing. Okay. And when you get Zach, then what happens after you get Zach? I'm freaking out and having no idea what to do or say. He called me. Okay, so we're listening to the defendant's police interview. I want to bring up two data points from Nelly in our chat room that I think are really uh, perceptive and, and bring them up to our guests uh, and see what their thoughts are. The fact is that Sterling only weighed ounces more than he did at the time of his death than he did at his birth, only ounces more after four months of being on earth. And um, typically, parents would keep a two-year-old in their own bedroom and the four-month-old in their room. I think these are really perceptive points. Gene, uh, what are your thoughts about what Nelly is indicating in terms of the prosecution utilizing those facts in some way to show that it was more about taking Sterling out, if you will, um, out of choice as opposed to an intoxication defense? What you had here were two homes. You had a home for the dog, for the daughter, for Cheyenne and Zach. And then you had the other home, which is really an area that was segregated for Sterling. And those two homes hardly ever interacted. What is profoundly devastating to the defendant is this interview. She shows relatively no remorse. She's no, no inflection in her voice. You can tell she kind of making things up as they go. This is a horrible interview for her. Um, and that, that uh, person who commented, the weight of the child is devastating. What I would like to know in that log that she had for the babysitter, did she have any entries for weight for Sterling? What was written for Sterling as opposed to the daughter? If one had no less detailed than the other, that goes to premeditation. Okay, so, Roger, what are your thoughts as well about what Nelly is indicating here, vis-a-vis the, -vis the weight and only ounces more at the time of death, as well as this, this concept? I'm trying in my head. I, I know it means something to me, uh, Gene saying it's two different homes where you have the two-year-old in there uh, as opposed to in their own room in the four-month with the parents. What is that telling you? It, it's telling me that they were paying more attention to the two-year-old and that they're, they just negligently left that baby sitting in a swing, facing a wall, and, and it is premeditation because they chose to ignore it. When you hear her statement, her statement is, well, I gave this child some cookies and I did this. No mention of the, of the child, of baby Sterling. She, right. She, he's right. She, there's no change in her voice. There's no tone. She does come across as articulate, but then if she's articulate, then the defense fails yes. because she had to be so out of it mentally that she couldn't be held responsible at that level. So the fact that she can articulate this minutes, hours after the, the police arrive shows that this defense is is dead in the water. It's not going to work. Yeah, I agree with you guys wholeheartedly. That interview is calculated, cold, doesn't seem to be the kind of responsiveness that one would have for such a tragedy. And, Roger, I agree completely that it goes right against this defense that she was so intoxicated she was incapable of care when shortly after this incident she's able to put it together and be able to articulate the way she is, albeit odd, uh, without any real emotion to the police. I think it's devastating for her, as Gene and Roger are telling us. We are going to take a quick break. Guys, you are really doing a great job on the legal an analysis here. I appreciate it. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. So, uh, Gene, Roger, uh, start with you, Roger. Are you hearing anything substantively uh, with regard to her answers that are helping the state's case, or is it more to the point that you had raised earlier about the lack of emotion and the fact that she's able to, close in time to the death, answer questions which goes against the intoxication defense? Bob, I think it's going against the intoxicated defense. She, she's speaking well. She. She's sort of monotone, but she's disconnected. But when I say disconnected, not disconnected like, 
when you're on drugs and, and you don't know what's going on in a room because she's, she's giving you timelines and how many times she eats and how many ounces, but she's disconnected in, in, in another way because obviously we know the child wasn't eating that much if it was, if it didn't, wait, what'd you say, wait, weighed one ounce more? I mean, she was starving the child probably so it wouldn't poop in its diaper so she wouldn't have to change it. It's difficult to watch. Even as a defense attorney, my job is always to find a defense. This is a difficult case for the defense. Yeah, it certainly is, Roger. Uh, Gene, what, do you, what are your thoughts about that? Are, are they scoring substantive points, uh, or is it more stylistic to go against the defense of intoxication here? I, I think they're scoring substantive points because um, the, the, the comments that she's making about the cookies – and about where, you know, the, the swing goes off. This shows that she's aware of what he has to put up with, what Sterling has to go through as a baby in that corner, which, is, which I'll call the second home. And, and it does attack the intoxication defense because I don't hear anything in that interview about how I was higher than a kite, I was intoxicated, I drank, I did drugs. There's nothing to indicate that she could not take care of the child. And I want to go back to your, uh, Quickly, your comment or about the weight. The more I think about it, that weight is probably the weightiest bit of evidence, no pun intended, right. for the government. Because if you're born seven months, seven pounds, Gee. and then four months later, you're seven pounds, bad. It's a problem. Hey, we got the McState family murder case. Charles Merritt's coming up next. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Okay, well, we're back on Law & Crime Network. As you know, we have been covering gavel to gavel the McStay family murder case. Uh, Charles Merritt is on trial. It's a very lengthy trial, very well-lawyered case. You see a picture of that entire family up and disappeared. Law enforcement thought that they had just left. However, a motorcyclist years later, three years approximately later, is driving his motorcycle in the desert and finds skeletal remains. And after examination, it turns out that all of the members of the McStay family were brutally killed. The weapon, the device used, a sledgehammer found yards away from the makeshift graves where their skulls were literally crushed. It is a absolutely horrific case. Like I said, all these people gone. Charles Merritt, the former business partner of the father of this family, is on trial. Let's listen to the 911 call that that motorcyclist made after the gruesome discovery. Hey, I'm out here on a motorcycle. I'm trying to dump. And I found what looks like a human skull. Can you give me a location? Yes. Okay. Um, west of the 15, and north of the the stock pile where the dump is. But you may have to just call the local sheriff and tell them where it's on a map. Because it's kind of, it's all dirt roads. I understand, but I'm just looking for a starting point. And this is the local sheriff. Oh, okay. That is funny. Started at the 15 North Southern Wells exit. Okay. Uh, let's see, is it over by the landfill? Yes. It's within, I'd say, about a half mile of the landfill. It's directly to the south of me. Okay, so from the landfill, where are you? Um, due north. Okay, so there's a 911 call made by that motorcyclist. You actually saw a shot of him on the witness stand testifying. Uh, Gene, we've discussed this case, you yep. and myself, uh, pretty extensively. Um, 
one of the defenses saying here, essentially, you got the wrong guy. Uh, you botched the case up in the investigation, and there were definitely some things law enforcement did not do correctly here. This is a really close case here, in my estimation, as a prosecutor, in securing a conviction. The defense is pointing a finger at this guy, Dan Cavanaugh, who also had a financial motive and, and uh, was having a problem uh, with Mr. McStay, and they're saying he's the one who did it, and the cops just rushed the judgment and pointed at Charles Merritt, saying he had a financial motive. Charles Merritt had a financial motive. But we've been saying all along, this is kind of like a crazy thing to kill an entire family. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to me as a homicide prosecutor for many years uh, for a financial crime. And the judge then excluded some very relevant data, in my mind, about Dan Kavanaugh potentially being third-party guilt here, as we would call it. Um, and then we find out last week, my last point that I just want to bring the viewers up to speed here, is that... Dan, more information is coming out about Dan Kavanaugh, including a, an anonymous tip that had been made when the family was thought just gone missing uh, that indicated Dan Kavanaugh was a suspect that the police never followed up on, which to me makes the Dan Kavanaugh information that was excluded by the judge even more relevant here. I see if there's a conviction of reversal based on the exclusion of that Dan Kavanaugh uh, you know, information. And Gene, we've been through two too many trials where we see years later prosecutors having to retry a case. Give me your general thoughts of what you see happening here. You're going to have a reversal on appeal. And what I would do if I were the defense attorney, I would file a motion for reconsideration of the judge's ruling to keep out that Dan Kavanaugh information. It is beyond belief that in a four person murder of a family, you're not allowing the defendant to say that somebody else did it, especially when you have circumstantial evidence, there's no confession. And the more I think about this, Bob and Roger, I can't imagine one human being killed all four people. It had to be two, three, could be four people. And we don't know if this was a hired job. We don't know if one of them was assisted by others. But I can't believe that one person committed all these murders. I don't believe it. Yeah, Roger, uh, to, to the point, let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. Uh, this is what we like to do as trial lawyers, bouncing things back and forth. The state alleges that they're going to have information showing cell phone records have uh, the defendant Charles Merritt's phone pinging off the area by the burial site around the time that these bodies would have been deposited there. Um, obviously, that's very powerful evidence. But I have also said, and I have seen in my own career, that doesn't necessarily prove, assuming that it's believed and assuming they can prove it, that, that he's the person who actually killed committed to murder. It certainly shows he has connection to something that occurred afterwards. What do you think about all this? Correct. You know, I'm real curious to hear the testimony of their expert um, when they ping the cell phone towers because they say the area. You know, you, you and I all know that usually a cell phone tower, when, when the police uh, coordinate it, they, they can get within 10 yards. So the general area, the general area of a, of a big desert, is it a mile away, five miles away, 10 miles away? When they say the general area, I don't know. So I think on that part, I'm thinking I'm gonna, we're going to see the battle of the experts. Yeah. Uh, but to go to your point, yeah, just being in the general area doesn't make the guy a murderer. It, it may, may have some connection, but it also may not. Yeah, it, it, this is a fascinating case. Razor, razor, uh, razor edgy to me, uh, thin here in terms of how we can go. Now, the state's not pulling any stops right now. They're putting on a full case. And like I said, I always love listening to experts, especially one of the experts in, in this case, Alexis Gray, who is a forensic anthropologist. She gave some testimony that was favorable to the state, but she also said some things that I think were really peculiar and odd. Let's take a listen, and I'll be back with Roger and Gene on the other the side. My name is Richard Lynch, a former, and then I had seen some remains sticking out that I thought probably indicated a fourth. Okay. You indicated that you saw some remains sticking out. Do you recall whether they were sticking out of grave A or grave B? Well, you would have to tell me which one you, which one we designated as grade A or grade B. I okay. don't remember. So if the one in front of you, if we looked at that and said that is grade B. Okay, grade B, then it would be grade A. Now, when you do this quick canvas, 
How worried are you about contaminating anything around you in terms of potential evidence? Um, moderately. I mean, we have to weigh our need to get over a large distance uh, versus um, um, preserving absolutely everything. In the desert, that's not possible anymore. So many factors have come in from animals to weather to other people, you know, coming through and all of that. The idea that you would have a pristine scene um, is something that you have to discard very early on. Is it practical to try to recover DNA from a crime scene like this? Objection, Foundation. Mm -hmm. No. Your Honor, I haven't heard. Can we be heard? Okay. No. The objections are ruled. It isn't practical because the, the possibility for contamination just from the local environment is too high. When you say foundation. Mm -hmm. When you say the local environment, what is it that you're referring to? I'm, I'm talking about that desert with, you know, the plants and the decomposing organisms and all of those things. DNA can be recovered in a lab from the from the remains or from anything if the if it's intact, uh, but it's not something that we would be trying to necessarily cover at that location. Well, I, I, every time I listen to this testimony, it just gets more bizarre to me, okay? R Roger, Gene and myself have already gone after this bad boy on a number of occasions, but let me tell you what I heard, and, and I need you to bring some sanity to my mind. I heard a person basically say she's not an expert in DNA, that somehow Definitely was not. allowed to give an opinion about DNA. Now, let's just stop right there. When I was in law school, they taught us that you can only give an opinion after you've been qualified as an expert. So we have a non-qualified expert. The state did an excellent job at saying that this person is not an expert. Give an expert opinion. And that opinion, let's go to the opinion, is that it's not a quote-unquote pristine crime scene. Now, I've been doing homicide cases my entire career, I've never even seen a pristine crime scene. I'm not even sure I know what a pristine crime scene is. But nevertheless, she indicates that it's not, quote, practical, without an explanation, to get DNA. The problem they have, Roger, my friend, please help me through this. The problem is, is that they did get DNA, and they got human DNA. The problem for the government is that DNA did not come back to any of the victims and did not come back to Charles Merritt. I think the prosecution not only is all over the place with regard to this, I think they've created another area of reversible error by allowing this Absolutely. witness to testify. And let me just put the cherry on top of the insanity here. The defense lawyer goes to make a record uh, as to foundation. All he hears is, overruled, and then goes to make a record, and the judge says, no, Roger, what is happening, my friend? It, it, it's unbelievable. I, when, I, when I heard that, and again, just like you, hearing it a second and a third time, you're going, what is the judge doing? I mean, he, he objected, overruled, at least get a sidebar. I mean, the judge is just shutting him down, and the foundation has not been laid. She is an anthropologist. She's not an expert on DNA. Oh, I took a couple classes. That's not enough. Who is she testifying about? It's not her area of expertise. The foundation is lacking, and it's definitely reversible error. She cannot be testifying about pristine sites and, and DNA when she's not qualified to do so. And Gene, they, but they got the DNA. They got it. The problem is you didn't like what it came back as, which is the defense's argument here. Now, Gene, we went off like crazy when this testimony first came out, but it's many days later, so I need to hear the Gene Rossi hashtag 4041 analysis of this insanity. If I'm the defense attorney, I'm very happy because she already gave her answer that you, it wasn't practical to get DNA. So if there was an objection sustained, move to strike, the jury's already heard it, the horse has left the barn. But this is good for the defense if I'm a defense attorney. I got overruled, I asked the judge if I could have a sidebar, I got overruled. When the appellate court gets this transcript, they're gonna say, this was bad. Not only did you keep out Kavanaugh, you're allowing this garbage 
from a non-qualified expert to go in so you have much, much stronger basis for reversal. Gene, and Roger, you, you, will, you will get to know me well enough soon enough. Gene knows already. I said it after training. We've trained prosecutors for many years. It is not just about winning a case. It's about getting to a truthful and just result, but having it survive appeal so it doesn't come back. 30 years of trying homicide cases, I've never had one come back on a guilty conviction, and all of them were guilty when I prosecuted them. May I say, Gene Rossi, hashtag 4041. And Roger, we're going to break. We'll be right back. Okay, so that is Detective Smith. He's one of the principal investigators in the case. Gene, um, the lawyer, this, this is one of those kind of witnesses. A uh, little, little hot, um, kind of combative on that witness stand. The lawyer's asking some pretty common sense questions that they really don't need to be argued with, but also bringing out all the investigative steps that were not done here. Let's not forget that they believe that this family was seen on, the police being, family was seen on the video going into Mexico. That went on for years until the bodies were found, or the, the remains of the bodies were found. What are your thoughts of his testimony? Well, the, the, the defense attorney's doing a good job of planting the seed and corroborating their defense that uh, those four people in that video crossing the border were in fact the McStay family, that they drove to San Diego, they drove to the border, and that it's it's likely or probable that somebody, some people took them to the desert and assassinated them. That's their theory. Right. And, and Roger, that goes to the point where he's saying is that the keys are in Joseph McStay's uh, pants pocket. And he's basically asking the cop, would it be reasonable to infer that he drove the vehicle uh, to that location? It's a fair inference. I wouldn't be combative in battling that. Exactly. He, he's being argumentative just because he's come to a conclusion and he doesn't want to admit to the point that the theme of the of the prosecution's uh, testimony is that the, the murder happened in the house, but there's no evidence of it. So the defense attorney, by going along this line of questioning, is showing that, A, could it ha they could have gone to Mexico. It could have been on their return trip from Mexico. It could have been at another location. No one knows where the murder occurred because there's no evidence that it occurred at the house, which is what the state is implying. And because they've narrowed themselves in so much so that it happened at the home where they believe it, it's become very difficult for them to, to get a conviction in this case. Based yeah, well, on that sort of testimony. Well stated, narrowed themselves in. I literally have been on crime scenes where murder cases where there's this investigative bias, confirmation bias, if you will, and it takes a lot to pull people back when they've made a decision that it is a particular person who is the culprit. Uh, and many times uh, I've literally seen that they're wrong. Ultimately, it turns out to be somebody else. I'm not saying it happened here, but it kind of sounds a little bit like it with respect to this particular detective. Let's listen to a little more of his testimony. <laughs> We can't tell you either way. We tried to compare, but we don't have what is suspected to be a cover from the laundry room in San Diego's uh, search warrant anyways. So I can't compare that to the cloth that Joseph was wrapped in. I can tell you it's consistent, but that's my personal opinion. I, I don't have any technical knowledge on that. I feel that that cover that Joseph was wrapped in could be the futon cover. I can't tell you if it was or wasn't. But the futon cover was big. Joseph was 6'1". Okay. Simple question. In all the photographs you saw, the people you talked to, the futon cover had zippers, correct? I believe it did, yes. Did you find any zippers in the grave on any of the blank material? No. And when you testified just here in your answer, you said other people told you the futon cover wasn't in the house. Is it true they told you it just it wasn't on the futon? You're grouping a lot of people into one, but suffice to say they couldn't locate the futon cover. All right, Detective Smith in the McStay family murder case. Roger, I believe I heard an audible from you literally during the cross-examination when they were talking about the futon, the zippers, and that the, there was no zippers found at the burial sites. What, what, were you, what was that? Uh, oh, what were you... I, I was just thinking, hey, Detective, Captain Obvious here. 
Um, if you're, you're, you're saying that it's consistent, but there's no zipper, the, the zipper didn't disappear in three years, right? It, it didn't, it didn't disintegrate. So uh, what I would do is if I was defending this case, I would have a paralegal or a legal assistant making a note of every single inconsistency and every single time that a witness for the prosecution said, well, I don't know, or I can't figure this out, or we can't tell you this. And I would make a list of those and I would use that in my closing. Yeah, Gene, I, that's a great point. Of course, that's what you want to do. You don't want to miss anything because it's gold for the defense here. Um, but I want to go back to that investigative bias, the confirmation bias. That This is kind of like the thing that we're talking about. You're saying it's your belief, and but yet in the face of objective physical data that should be present if your theory is correct, you still can't bring yourself to say, you know, I, I could be wrong about that. And yet you fight for it like it is an absolute truth, despite contradictory evidence. You've seen this, haven't you, Gene? I have, I, but, but I never went forward against a man who may have not done the crime, but I I have seen confirmation bias attempted, and, and, and you do have it here because Kavanaugh allegedly made a statement in 2013 that he knows how to get rid of people. He confessed to his girlfriend, I think, in 2016 or 15, and then you have the whole tipster. So you basically have three bits of evidence that point towards Kavanaugh, and then they say that Kavanaugh was in Hawaii on the day of the murder. But that supports my, my belief that this was not done by one person. It was done by two, three, or four people, and they could have been hired to kill them. And, and we've covered cases like that here at the Long Crime Network. And I agree with you, Gene, that that could be an alternative theory here. And let's not forget that Mr. Kavanaugh is alleged to have text messages where Mr. McStay is writing back, now me, my wife, and the kids. It's interesting he puts that, know who you are, know what you're about. And I believe, I believe, I may be wrong, uh, somebody can correct me later on, and if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself, that he indicated he knows how to get rid of people in a desert. I, I just, I think that that may be part of the facts of this case. Yet as we know, Gene and Roger, the judges have substantially excluded the defense from bringing out the third-party guilt of Kavanaugh that the defense wanted to, which is why we all believe collectively is an automatic reversible error, especially as this case tends to get weaker and weaker for the state, in my humble opinion. we got to go break to break. Stick with us. We'll have Roger and Gene for more analysis on this fascinating McStage family murder case. Okay, so the, that's from the mouth of Charles Merritt. You saw on the screen that was being played in the courtroom, him speaking to the police. Roger, what I find interesting about this is, as a defense attorney, I can use this portion of the tape substantially to my benefit. He knows he could be potentially arrested. He knows that they're kind of looking at him. That is clear. And he would have been completely within his rights to say, look, given all that, I really can't get involved in this. But I'm the defense lawyer in the case. I'm saying, but ladies and gentlemen, what compelled him to put himself in harm's way? His concern about the McStay family and that by depriving the police of any information, even though at great peril to himself, he went there because he didn't want to be responsible for them not being found. I think that's pretty compelling in the hands of a good defense lawyer. What do you think? I, I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, it, it's bolstering, right? But there's no objection to it. So he's bolstering his testimony by saying, look, I'm here. I know I have a warrant that maybe maybe I'm I'm a, an attempted burglar or whatever the, the charge was that he had a felony warrant for. But, hey, that is less important than my friend. So, yes, it, it, it scores points. Um, whether or not he's guilty of this crime, I, we, we still don't know. But there's definitely some positive things for the defense and the defense is going to make use of them. Gene, I always go back to experience as a ruler, you know, in, in terms of measuring cases. I had one one time where a woman was brutally murdered. She was in the middle of a very contentious divorce. Uh, it, it, there was rage, a rage killing. The husband, soon to be ex-husband, was on the chopping block. The investigators clearly thought that he was the person who did it, brought him in, and he basically invoked his rights to remain silent because he said, I get it. I'm the ex-husband. We're in a really nasty divorce. I 
want to help, but I'm just afraid you guys are going to arrest me. And that even made the cops think more that he was guilty because he wasn't willing to help. Turns out he wasn't the person who did it. The person who actually committed the murder is spending the rest of her life behind state uh, prison bars in New Jersey. It, it, so these things can go both ways, yet Merrick goes down and puts himself in the harm's way. Do you think he's helping himself at least this part of the tape? Yes, I do. And it goes back to the Cheyenne Harris tape. You know, the inflection, the intonation, the, the pauses of her were very incriminating, I thought. Unless he's, you know, Lawrence Olivier, one of the best actors in history, when he said that Joseph was one of my best friends and, you know, it goes back to motive. Is this man, Charles Merritt, going to kill four people, including two young children, because he thinks that Joe owes him about twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Is he really going to do that for forty thousand dollars or whatever it was? Uh, it just doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't seem to fit. Yeah, and, and you make a great point, uh, Gene, about the intonation and how important it is to actually listen. And if you have an opportunity video, as opposed to a trial we covered earlier this year where it was a trial by transcript. They were just having actors essentially reading uh, transcripts from many decades ago. Never gives you the same feel that, like Gene is saying, the audio of Charles Merritt, who seems very genuine. Uh, so we'll see about that. Let's just listen to a little bit more, and I'll come back with Gene and Roger, and we'll discuss Charles Merritt's statements to see whether it's helping him or it's helping the prosecution, as it is the prosecutor that is actually introducing this evidence. Listening to the prosecutor introducing Charles Merritt's statement to the police in court. Gene, to your previous point about his intonation, his inflections, bringing up Dan and Joseph not being too happy about the financial arrangements with Dan. Um, so far, I'm not seeing anything that's hurting him. How about you? I agree. <laughs> I and I got. I was going to add this at the last point. A prosecutor does not have to to present the entire confession or statement of a defendant who's interviewed. They can slice it under the rules of evidence. But it seems like they're playing the full Monty, and the full Monty seems to have information that helps uh, the defendant. Yeah, you know, to that point, Roger. I remember when I became the head of, of my agency, I the prosecutors there tended to always want to introduce the quote unquote confessions. Um, and many times I said, let's make a distinction between a confession and a statement that the defendant is giving, because many times they present their defense right in the statement itself. If you don't admit the statement and you still move forward with your case, you may force the defendant to have to take the witness stand because in order for them to make their defense, he doesn't have the statement that was introduced by the prosecutor. Could we be looking at a scenario here where the prosecutors are just reflexively putting a statement that actually helps the defense? I, I think so. There, there's really nothing because he's already given his statement. He's already explained his relationship. He's already explained how they came to know each other and the little things that he knows about Dan Kavanaugh and that he owed you know $2,000 more so he could buy him out. So it's, this defense is set there. Normally, if anything, it's the state that's objecting to that when the defense wants to bring it in, right? right? Because in effect, it's a self-serving statement. So right. why, didn't the, why didn't the prosecutor file a motion to keep it out? I, I don't know. Well, I don't I, know what their logic is. I, I've, I've done this. I've, I've literally, in murder cases, not introduced a defendant's statement. I thought I had enough in my direct case. It forces the defendant on the stand. Now I'm using the statement for purposes of cross-examination nation, as opposed to trying to put a piece of evidence in that may hurt my case, make the defense's defense for them without having to put the defendant on the stand. Hey, guys, in, in the Law and Crime Network, our audience that's out there, our people in the chat room, you can't get legal analysis like you can with Gene and Roger. These guys are just off the hook on trial tactics. We have to take a break. Stay with us, though, because we will be back. So there's the courtroom testimony of Detective Bachman. You see actually the bones reduced to just bones and an electrical cord in the area of where the neck was. Let's listen to a little bit more of this testimony. Describe what you're seeing or what you recognize. The 
photo here basically is at the uh, toward the completion of the excavation process. Uh, basically, the way that we excavated is we uh, tried to uh, basically pedestal the, the victim there in the ground so that we could see the, uh, the way that he was laid out inside the grave. Um, as I spoke earlier, you can see the here's the red strap that's, that uh, is wrapped around the cloth blanket. So. Uh, part of the blanket was able to be removed, but it was it was very brittle due to the fact that it was soaked in decomposition fluids. Um, there's the white strap that actually goes up, and it was wrapped around the victim's neck. Uh, the victim was clothed in a uh, green shirt. Uh, part of the green shirt was located there. He had on gray uh, cloth shorts, and then a, a set of uh, what were labeled uh, gray, I'm sorry, gray, gray, gray jeans underwear. You mentioned in there um, that no leg segments were found below the kneecap. Is that demonstrated by what you're seeing in this exhibit? Yes, sir. So his, uh, basically what would be the femoral, femoral condyles, and uh, what was described to me as, uh, through one of the, I think it was through Dr. Gray, uh, basically extends right here, but there were no lower portions of uh, the decedent's legs located inside the grave. Did you find anything that appeared to be feet? Um, no, sir. Or at least readily recognizable as feet. No, after we removed the, the victim from the grave, we located a pair of socks underneath the, the victim's body, but uh, there was nothing um, of any indication of lower legs or feet uh, there inside the grave. Is there a compass depicted in 212 also to orient? Okay, welcome back. So, uh, Gene, Roger, we only have a short time, my friends, uh, left in my time here hosting, which ends at 3 o'clock. You guys have been amazing guests. Uh, I hope we can do this uh, team again. So we listened to Detective Bachman um, giving some pretty gruesome, those photos are pretty gruesome, again, very visceral. But this, this isn't a case about that. This is a case of who did it. This is a who done it case. But Bachman still has to give us some information about the state of these bodies. It is a critical factor in the case. What are your thoughts, uh, Roger, in terms of how he's doing? He's doing fine. You know, it's 10 years to the day that the McStay family has been missing, right? Today's February 4th. Um, and he's going through all of the groundwork showing how horrific the murder is. And, and obviously, it's the state's burden to prove that, that it was this gentleman, the defendant in the case. And, you know, they're working to do that. But... It's a long process, and they have to walk through it as gruesome and horrific as the scene is. He's doing what he needs to do. Yeah, Gene, you know, something that just strikes me, it kind of goes back to the point you were mentioning before. We just saw a picture of that sledgehammer, three-pound sledgehammer. I mean, this is just really a, a, some unbelievable way to kill an entire family. This is the state's theory over money, um, over a business deal, of which, again, Dan Cavanaugh has a business problems as well with Joseph McStay. But, wow, it's really up close, personal, and really serious for a guy who's never really been in that kind of trouble before. And it goes to what I said earlier, is that I find it hard to believe that one person did all this, the yeah. sledgehammer, the cord, bringing the bodies to the Mojave Desert. I don't see how that one person, whoever it is, did it by themselves. This had to be a group activity, two, three, four people. I really believe that. Yeah, it definitely. Listen, in, in the five seconds or less, each one of you, I mean, who's who's winning this battle right now? I know it's an unfair question. Roger, <laughs> is the defense doing it or the state? Who's winning? I don't know that anyone's winning it yet, but I mean, the points are slowly being made. The prosecution's giving its best, but it leans a little bit towards the defense right now. All right, and Gene Rossi, we're going to have to get to your answer on Wednesday if you're going to be on the show, because unfortunately for me, the show is ending. You can find Gene Rossi at Rossi4VA or at Prove My Innocence 1 for Roger. Thanks, guys.